nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. Yesterday, the central concept I was trying to get across is this idea of an elastic resistor, you know, which, as I said, when you first say it almost sounds, it can be right even, because the resistor has to dissipate heat. And if it's elastic, that means it doesn't exchange energy. So how does it dissipate heat? Of course, the central point is that it goes through the channel, as shown on that right-hand side little figure there, without losing any energy, but the actual energy is all dissipated in the contacts. That's the view. And what this also tells you is that resistance is not necessarily associated with the heat dissipation per se. That is, you could have resistance in between because inside the channel, let's say you have an obstacle of some sort. That would increase the resistance. But it's not necessarily dissipating any heat. The dissipation is still in the contacts as far as the elastic resistor goes. <clears throat> now this, of course, what has made it particularly interesting in recent years is that it seems to be a good representation of many nanoscale devices anyway. But the whole idea sort of dates back to Landauer, which is like 50 years ago, when all this was not even experimentally relevant. And he was thinking of it more as a conceptual tool for understanding transport, because I think he kind of saw that transport, there are these two types of phenomena involved. The dynamical ones where that's this part where you do not exchange energy and the energy exchanging part, the irreversible part where you're giving up heat and things like that. And what makes transport complicated is these two things are intertwined. And anytime you can separate it out, it makes it much easier to understand what's happening. And <clears throat> this elastic resistor, let me just make one comment that, you know, one thing you could say that, well, real resistors, long resistors, especially if you have bias across them, of course, there's a lot of inelastic scattering inside the channel as well. And this, the question is, why does the, why could we use the elastic resistor concept to be deriving results that are valid for big conductors. Because one of the points I tried to make was that if you look at those expressions we obtained from the elastic resistor point of view for the conductivity or uh, those are standard results, which are derived not for elastic resistors but for regular resistors using much more advanced formalisms, using Boltzmann or Kubo formalisms. That expression for conductivity as density of states times the diffusion coefficient, for example. You see? So those are really standard results. But we are obtaining it with this elastic resistor model, which shows that it really captures a lot of physics, basically. See? And so one way to justify it would be to say, well, the real long resistor is, so you can think of it like a series of little elastic resistors, as if it goes elastically then loses some energy, goes elastically, then loses some energy, and so on. But what, of course, makes this thing very tricky is the point that, you see, if you have a little elastic section here, we know that the resistance is rho L plus lambda over A. And then you have another section we discussed. And so this is, say, L1, and this is L2. And if you just add them up in series, you'll get the wrong result. Why? Because you'll be counting the lambda twice. You'll be counting this interface resistance twice. So the thing is that if you're thinking of it this way, the point you have to be clear on is, that it, this is why it's so important to sort out where all this resistance comes from, really. And the point to recognize is, this is the part that is associated with all kinds of obstacles along the way inside the resistor, which is why the longer it is, the bigger it gets. And then there's a constant part, which is simply involved in getting in from the contacts into a resistor and getting out. And that part, of course, does not happen in between. Because those in-between contacts are not really there. They're just conceptual things you're thinking of, right? So 
that is the point you have to be careful on when you are applying these ideas. And of course, one new thing that comes out of it is just this thing that the resistance is conductivity times area divided by lambda plus L, whereas what we usually do is have an L there. So that is the important, of course, conceptual part. But otherwise, the expression for conductivity, etc., looks much the same, really. And I don't mean to imply then, though, that there couldn't be all kinds of extra things that come in when inelastic scattering is actually uh, distributed rather than in lumps like this. So there could be other issues involved, you see. But elastic resistor is a very good starting point. So in my mind, it is almost like the hydrogen atom for transport. It's like where you start. That's the one. And what I'll try to do in the next few lectures, basically, is try to show you how with elastic resistors, you can understand all kinds of other things as well. We'll talk about heat flow, spin, flow of spin, all kinds of other things. We'll go deeper into it. So far, what you'll, all you have done is semi-classical transport. This particular lecture will talk about quantum transport, quantum transport through an elastic resistor. You see? Now, everything I, <coughs> so one example I quoted yesterday where I said, you know, inelastic scattering can make an enormous difference. Well, if you had one channel connected to the left, one channel connected to the right, and there was no inelastic scattering in between, you wouldn't have any current. On the other hand, anytime you turn on inelastic scattering, there will be lots of current. So obviously, the lower one is not even an approximation for the upper one. Okay? So not everything is captured, of course. There are other th issues, and as I said, said yesterday, PN junctions to some extent are a little bit like this. Now, <clears throat> so today, this lecture then is about quantum transport. And because everything we talked about yesterday, it's called, that would come under the category of semi-classical transport. So in terms of the basic physics, nothing we said yesterday would, I mean, everything we said is contained in the Boltzmann equation. So whatever I said is consistent with what you'd get if you solve Boltzmann equation, it's just that you could see it, I hope, much more clearly because we were looking at an elastic resistor where there wasn't a lot of inelastic scattering in the channel. Whereas Boltzmann equation, of course, itself could handle all the inelastic scattering. There's a clear prescription. It's just that it wouldn't be as easy to see what happened. That's all. Okay. And <clears throat> so in that sense, the corresponding thing to Boltzmann for quantum transport is this NEGF method, which some of you are familiar with and some of you are not probably, and I won't assume you're familiar with it, but then the purpose of this lecture is not so much to teach you NEGF if you don't know it already. It is more to tell you what it is about, what exactly you're doing physically. It's more about the concepts involved than about the mechanics of how you do it. Because one thing you realize in all this that I think Mark also mentioned this, that you know, calculating something and understanding something are kind of separate issues. I mean, one helps the other, but then, they're not identical, really. And so I'm not going to talk too much about the calculating part. And there, if you have questions, maybe we could use the discussion session for some of that if you want, right? But the one question with quantum transport that often comes up is, and that is what I kind of want to illustrate a little bit, is that, well, for quantum mechanics, one thing we have all heard of is a Schrodinger equation that describes the quantum mechanics of different material, uh, I mean, atoms, solids, etc. So why exactly do we need an NEGF formalism? Why do we need something else? Couldn't we just go to Schrodinger equation, for example? Okay. Then that is the conceptual part I want to kind of get across in this talk. Okay. So <clears throat> what we'll consider then is this elastic resistor. And oh, let me just mention this for those of you who are familiar is that the, these are the equations of NEGF that some of you, as you know, have seen it, some of you haven't. And the general scheme is the following, that you have a channel that is represented by a Hamiltonian, that H. That's on the right-hand side, if you look, that's this H. This is the Hamiltonian whose eigenvalues give you the allowed energy levels. That's the part you always learn in quantum mechanics, usually. And, of course, usually the way you see Schrodinger equation is, like E psi is equal to H psi, 
And that H is usually a differential operator. But one of the things I think you learn is that you can convert it into a matrix. And usually whenever you do a numerical calculation, the differential equation is usually quite convenient for analytical solutions. But many problems in quantum mechanics, as you know, don't really have analytical solutions. In fact, there's very few that have, really. And when you solve it numerically, most of the time you convert it into a matrix, one form or another, usually. And the eigenvalues of that matrix give you the energies. That's how usually it is operates. Okay. Anyway, so that's that H. So it's a matrix whose size depends on the size of your device, of the channel, essentially. So, for example, if you think of the channel as, say, if you're using one of these real space, you know, the tight binding models, and if your channel has, say, 10 spatial points, then H would be a 10 by 10 matrix, for example. Okay. Now, the part that is not as well appreciated is this connection to the contacts. And as I said, for the elastic resistor, of course, you see that is very important because as we discussed last day, they, all this, it is this connection to the contacts that makes this current flow through this thing because something comes in and something goes out. And that's the part which you normal quantum mechanics courses, you don't quite hear much about. You hear a lot about the H. You learn about the Hamiltonian, all kinds of H, how to find eigenvalues, etc. What you don't quite see much of is how to connect to the surroundings, etc. Okay? And, <clears throat> and there I've written this sigma 1, which is the connection to the left contact, sigma 2, which is the connection to the right contact. And in between there's a sigma s, which in general means all kinds of scattering processes inside the, the channel itself. And as I said, 20, 30 years ago when your people were dealing with d big devices, big <laughs> conductors, nobody worried about the contacts. So this NEGF formalism when it was first developed back in the 60s, of course, no one was thinking about contacts at all. And they didn't have a sigma 1 or a sigma 2. And then in those days, of course, the physics of resistance was all in the sigma s. It was all about the scattering, you see? Whereas, again, in the uh, 90s, once days, people started looking at small conductors. That is where, of course, this elastic resistor is a very useful way of thinking about small conductors. And then you, as a starting point, you can drop the sigma s. You can just use a connection to the left contact, a connection to the right contact, sigma 1 and sigma 2. And that is, of course, in terms of understanding, that's much easier because the theory of sigma s is a whole lot more complicated than the theory of sigma 1 or sigma 2. I mean, this connection to the contact, that's a whole lot easier to understand. And so again, for the, because of the history of this subject, again, most of the literature uses fairly advanced formalisms to come up with these equations. On the other hand, what I'll try to show you is how straight from the one electron Schrodinger equation, you can see where it all comes from. That's basically what I'll try to get across. If you had to do a real calculation, then of course you'd say, well, I'm interested in graphene, how do I write down H? Next, how do I write down the sigmas, etc." And that I won't go into, because that some of you are familiar with, and those of you who are not, I can't quite tell you in half an hour. I mean, it'll take longer. So I won't really go into that part on how you write those things down. But once you have those, the left-hand side gives you all the equations you need to calculate it because these are all matrices. And once you have written the matrices, the left-hand side basically at the end of it tells you how to get current, for example, out of it, given those matrices. So first step is to write the matrices and this is it. That's all. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So. To understand this then, let's start with the, again, the simplest elastic resistor, which is a device with one level. And so I'll assume that in this contact, F is equal to one. What I mean by that is, I'm assuming the chemical potential is up here and, and around this energy for the moment, let's assume F is one, but of course, F could be anything. You just have to multiply finally by that F1 minus F2. But for this discussion, let's assume this is one, this is zero at the moment. And we're trying to calculate the current through that level. And what I'll do is, first we'll do what's on the left-hand side, which is like a simple semi-classical picture. 
you know, like thinking of electrons as particles, go in and out. And then we'll do the same problem with Schrodinger equation. We'll say, okay, we're thinking of it as a wave. What new things come out of it? And we'll do that, right? And what I'll do on the right-hand side, though, basically the whole NEGF method gives you a formal way of doing this with many levels and all that in a systematic way. You don't have to worry about it anymore. But in terms of understanding what you're doing, this is a very good example to try. You know, one level, how do I do the quantum mechanics of it? So one level, so let me try to write down the, first let's do what's on the left. That's this uh, semi-classical picture. So there you'd say, okay, here, I've got a level here. The rate at which the number of electrons in that level changes, if I put an electron in here, it will want to escape out into the contacts, depending on how well coupled it is. And that's, tell, that's that second, uh, equal to minus nu1 plus nu2 times n. Nu1 is the rate at which it wants to escape into the first contact. Nu2 is the rate at which it wants to escape into the second contact. So I put something like this. So this would be sort of like a lifetime. So this could be like one every picosecond, for example. So that would be like 10 to the 12th per second, some such number. Okay. So this would be one. And then that last term there, that is like the rate at which electrons come in from the left contact. Because I've assumed this is one, that's zero, so electrons only want to come in from here, nothing's coming in from that side. So I could write plus S1. So what would be the steady state occupation, steady state number of N? Well, let's set that to zero. Steady state. So you'd get n is equal to now how do I one way to fix the strength of this s1 is to say that well one thing I know is if there was no coupling to the right hand side so let's say I detached this completely what that means is this was not there then what should have happened is this level should have just become full <laughs> because it's connected to a contact which wants to keep it full. You know, the point I made last year, the reason current flows is this one wants to fill it up, that one wants to empty it. Now, if this was the only contact it was connected, connected to, then of course it would just get full. So if nu2 isn't there, then n should just be 1. So which sort of tells me that this ought to be equal to nu1. That's the str Otherwise, I won't even get the right answer for one contact. You see? So with that justify that argument, you can kind of set the strength of what's coming in. So instead of S1, then I'll put nu1. So that tells you the steady state number of electrons in there. And after this, you can calculate the current pretty easily if you want. Because what you could do is, uh, <clears throat> actually, an interesting way of writing this, you could write this in two parts. So I'll write this as this S1 minus nu1 n minus nu2 n. So I just regrouped them a little bit. Why is that? Because when you regroup it, you can kind of look at this. This is like the current. This is the rate at which electrons are coming in from contact one. I see this is the rate at which it is kind of coming in. This is the rate at which it is going back out. So the net current at contact one is this one. And the net current at contact two is that one. And steady state, they're equal, of course. Whatever comes in goes out. So when I'm trying to evaluate current, the thing is, this whole thing is zero, but then this one or that one will give me the net current. I could look at either one. That's the point. And the thing is, this is important because when you, this is a very good guide to what to do with the quantum thing also. You see? Here it's pretty clear before we bring in all the other stuff. Okay. So if you look at any one of them, and of course this one has only one term, so that's easier to do. So what is the current then? just nu2 times that.
Yes, please. So, uh, do you assume that uh, there's no reduction coming back from the environment? Right, because the right contact, I'm assuming we are at an energy such that the Fermi function is zero, and so nothing is coming back, and once it goes out, it gets pulled out. Because that, as I've always mentioned, that this is the part that no one quite tells you explicitly. But the point I make is, ordinarily, if electrons went from here to there, sooner or later, they would all come back again, and there would be no net current. Current flows because as soon as you get there, somebody pulls it out. And whatever is left in here, somebody fills it out. That's why it keeps going forever. And this is the part that is not in any Hamiltonian, not anywhere. You have to put it in, and usually it is done rather surreptitiously, and you kind of don't appreciate that part. So, yes. So, and this is zero. Otherwise, in general, what would have happened is this current would have been multiplied by F1 minus F2. That's what would have happened in general if we had two different Fermi, if the F1 and F2, instead of, I assumed 1 and 0, but if this was, say, 0 0.5 and 0 0.3 at that energy, then you would have to put that in. That's the same argument we had. I mean, in all these elastic resistors, at the end of the day, we'll have different expressions for this G, but basically it will always have this structure. There is this F1 minus F2, okay? Because F1 is what's driving left to right, right to left. So eventually you'd have this also. And the way I've done the current, of course, this is just per second, you see? If I really want uh, amperes, then I should, of course, multiply by Q or minus Q, depending on how you're keeping track of what's the sign convention for your current. But basically, you'd have to multiply by a Q to do this, right? Now, <clears throat> if you remember yesterday, when I tried to write down the current, I said that if you had just one level, the current would be Q over T times F1 minus F2. And the idea was that this T, I said, is the time it takes to get from left to right, this transfer time. So in this model, this thing is like 1 over T. To look at it. So after we calculate it, you could say that whatever I called transfer time yesterday, I said, well, in the rate at which electrons are going is this T, and so current would be Q over T. That's how I kind of started last year, okay? So in this context, you could say 1 over T is nu 1 nu 2 over nu 1 plus nu 2. Or you could turn this around and say T is equal to And that kind of makes sense because this is what you might call interface limited transport sort of. It's like it doesn't make too, mu too much difference how long the electron takes inside because it's such a short device. The real time it takes, the time it takes to get from here to here is essentially limited by the getting in and the getting out. And one of them you could say is the time associated is 1 over this rate. Like if this is 10 to the 12th per second, then it's like a picosecond. 1 over that, and so total time is still like the sum, right? Yeah. So the new term is a rate? Is a rate, right, right. So this term here, that's a rate, its dimensions is per second. So if we're assuming that no electrons go into the contact that's already flowing, why can we not start off just by assuming mu1 is 0? Because if an electron is in the channel, it won't go back to the full contact. Now it can always get back in, right? Because, uh, no, from here you are continually, uh, so let's say you don't, yeah, you want an equation that will work regardless of your F1s and F2s, right? So for example, supposing both contacts were empty, then what should happen is you could start out with some electrons in the channel and it will just empty out. So for example, if this was zero, this will tell you that the number of electrons will die out with a time constant of so much. Okay? That's the rate at which it will just empty out into the channels. Okay. okay. So in this model, all I'm saying is that the transfer time is just like the sum of the time associated with contact one and the time associated with contact two. Right? And this you can call the kind of limit of interface limited transport that your conductance is just determined by interfaces. What determines these rates? 
how well connected your device is to the contacts. So physically I'd say if I put an electron in the channel, how long do I have to wait before the extra electron is lost? Is it picosecond, microsecond, nanosecond? That, that's the physical picture. Okay? If you have a wall to other uh, contacts, what will happen to the To the, right. then you'd have to, if you had multiple contacts here, then I guess you could associate different times associated with going from one to two or two to three, etc. Right? Then you'd, that you'd kind of need a multi-terminal formula with different times associated with different points. Okay. Okay. okay now let's do the quantum version of this. You see, that's the one I was trying to get at. Yes, please. Does one contact uh, changes the injection efficiency of another? No, not in this model, the way you're thinking. You've got a channel, one's filling up, one's emptying it. Now the corresponding thing, when you write a Schrodinger equation, it would look something like this. Nice thing about the one level equation though is, as I said, in general, the Schrodinger equation would have looked like IH bar D psi DT is equal to H psi, where this H is the, is a, is a matrix, the Hamiltonian matrix whose eigenvalues give you all the energy levels. Now in this case, we are doing a one level thing. There's only one energy level. And so basically it is, this is just a number epsilon. Now, if you happen to have two levels, then this would be a two by two matrix. That would be a good place to start. Okay? So this makes the Schrodinger equation particularly simple. And this would be the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And then there is a time independent Schrodinger equation, which amounts to saying that if you write psi as this is time dependent, and then there's a the time independent one, where you do this. And then this will look like E psi equals epsilon psi. That's the usual form. Okay. Now, <clears throat> and then you say the only way you could have an electron inside is if its energy happened to be exactly equal to epsilon. If you don't match that in energy, you can't, electron can be inside, psi will be zero. That's basically it. Okay. Now, <clears throat> This we cannot use for the problem as is because it is describing a isolated system. That's the point. This is just the level by itself. What we have is this connection to the context, things coming in. So this part of it, if you find the rate at which the number of electrons changes, because the number would be like psi psi star. So let's say we try to find d dt of psi psi star. And you, you can actually show this very quickly is that the answer will be zero. You'll see why? Because, you know, this is like psi d psi psi star dt plus d psi dt times psi star. And <clears throat> then you can use this d psi dt to replace this part. So instead of this, I could put in epsilon over i h bar psi. And instead of this, I could put in epsilon psi over minus i h bar. I picked up the minus because I complex conjugated it. So you could, and then you'll see the two terms just cancel each other out. So basically, if you're using this equation, it tells you that the number of electrons in that level won't change. D and D T is zero. That's it. So if you use that, that is equivalent to putting d and dt equals zero. But what we need is to put in things corresponding to this, this, and that. And in a way, those are the sigmas in the NEGF formalism, you see. That's the h. h doesn't give you any changes. Then there's the sigma one, there's a sigma two, and then there's the driving term. That's basically where you're headed, see. Okay. Now, how do you put that in? 
Well, the answer, the way it goes is that if I put an epsilon minus, say, i gamma over 2, supposing I do that, so this is, of course, a real number, but now I'm adding an imaginary number. Now, what you can show easily is that in that case, the ddt of psi psi star will actually be, it won't exactly cancel out. Because instead, because this one, the imaginary one, that one actually will find what you get from here and what you get from here will add instead of canceling out. And the net result is that at the end of the day, you'll find you'll get minus gamma psi psi star. This is a little bit of algebra, you can check it out. So finally, you'll get this. So adding something like this here is sort of equivalent to adding a gamma times n. You know, that's the kind of thing we are trying to add here, you see, to get this effect. So the simplest way to get it into Schrodinger equation is to put a minus i gamma. And, and you'll note that you have to, if you want to, actually this will be gamma over h bar because the way I've done this, gamma has the dimensions of energy because it's epsilon is energy, that's also energy. Whereas what I get here, of course, has the dimensions of per second, just like nu. And energy divided by h bar is, of course, per second because energy is like h nu divided by h, that's like per second. So the point is that in order to get this nu1 plus nu2 here, what you need to do with the Schrodinger equation in order to get the equivalent of that is put a gamma1 and a gamma2. And what are gamma1 and gamma2? Well, those things divided by h bar. So gamma 1 or gamma 2 divided by h bar should be equal to what was nu 1 or nu 2 in the semi-classical model. So this was the rate at which electrons escaped into contact 1 or contact 2. What you should do is put this. That's what you should do. Yeah. What's the effect of Why the 2 there? Yeah, rough. Basically, the idea is this, that when you look at the solution to this, psi looks like e to the power minus gamma t over h bar over 2, right, because of the 2 that I put in. So usually what happens is psi is e to the power minus i epsilon t over h bar. Now, because there's a i there, the corresponding solution looks like this. Now, what you want is the probability to decay as gamma t over h bar. And probability is the square of this. So when you do psi psi star, that takes off the two. So in order for the probability to decay with gamma, the wave function has to decay as gamma over two. Because probability is psi square. That's about it. So why do you make it a complex one, i gamma one? Right, if I put anything real, then d, uh, d dt of dn dt would be zero. d dt of psi psi star would remain zero because putting anything real there is just like changing the epsilon a little bit. That that makes no difference to the basic thing. You see, and the basic and the reason you see that if it is anything real, then the solution looks like this, and the magnitude squared of that is always one. It's independent of one, independent of time. Nothing changes. That, that's basically it. But by putting this in, you add a solution that looks like this. And then the magnitude is actually changing with time. And it represents the fact that you have connected this system to the contacts and things are going out into the contacts. That's about it. So now the corresponding time independent Schrodinger equation, if I were writing it, would look something like this. So 
where I write gamma as gamma 1 plus gamma 2. And there is one more thing I need and that is the source term. Remember what I have done is kind of change the Schrodinger equation to get this effect in it. In the sense that if I take that equation and find dn dt, it will look like this. It will match this semi-classical picture I have in mind. And then there is the additional source term I would need to put in. So let me put S1 say. Okay. Now, <coughs> Then you can write the solution easily. <clears throat> now, one of the important things that comes out of the quantum way of doing it compared to the classical picture is what's called broadening. And that's the point I wanted to illustrate. And that is, see, in this problem that we are talking about, that I've got a level here, which is at epsilon, classically the way we think, only way an electron could get from left to right through this would be if its energy matched that epsilon exactly. If it was a little bit off one way or the other, as long as it's all elastic, nothing would, it wouldn't be able to get through. But quantum mechanically, it doesn't quite have to match. I mean, E could be a little bit different from epsilon, and you'd still have a wave function inside in response to your source. So your epsilon's right here, E is a little bit off, doesn't quite match. That's fine. You could still get a response to it. Okay. Of course, when E is equal to epsilon, this is zero, and so the response is a maximum. That's fine, but it doesn't have to match exactly. And so, what you'd find is that if you looked at the electron, if it is not exactly on this, a little bit off, then it will broaden it out somewhat. Effectively. So, this connection to the contacts is giving you a broadening. And, <clears throat> and this comes out of the quantum treatment. It is a wave effect in a way, you see, this whole thing. Now, the point I wanted to make here also is the following, that if you take this one level system and you used our semi-classical picture, the one that we discussed last day, and let's say we calculated the current versus voltage. And for this discussion, let's assume is uh, zero temperature. So, got this and what I do is I at zero voltage mu2 is here and then I pull it down. So gradually I'm pulling the drain down and I have this perfect electrostatic so this one doesn't move down. I don't want all that complication. I'm just pulling this down. Then what will happen is at first no current will flow. As soon as I cross this, current will start flowing. So basically you'd have something looking like this. So if you looked at di dv, that's the conductance. So supposing someone measures this and then they looked at the conductance, right around here, you see the conductance would look like it has this enormous peak. Question is, how big is that peak? And of course, one point I tried to get across yesterday we discussed is how there is this maximum conductance. You see, we wrote the conductance as is Q squared over H times M with the idea that M tells you how many channels you have. And if you have one channel, it should be Q squared over H. Usually people measure two Q squared over H because there's always the two spin channels, okay? But that's the best you could get, you know, if it was ballistic conduction and all that. Now, what is a little bothersome when you look at this is it looks like there's no upper limit to that P. That could be anything. It could be way up something. And because, you know, this is a very sharp level as you're connecting through, as you're conducting through it, you can show that the maximum current you'll get will be something like Q gamma over H bar. Actually, gamma 1, gamma 2 over gamma 1 plus gamma 2, etc. So it'll be something like this. And if the transition takes place infinitely sharp, 
then of course the conductance is infinite, you see. But the fact is experimentally people have now measured this even in a hydrogen molecule, you know, something where this is a pretty good model, you know, where you're really conducting through one level. So this is not just an academic thing we're doing, this represents what happens in a hydrogen molecule really. And when they make good contacts to it and they measure the conductance, they do get, you know, 2 Q square over H, I mean something on that order. So what, what did we miss here? Well, what we missed here is this broadening that goes with it. The point is that that level won't be this sharp once you connect to it properly from the contacts. Once you connect from the contacts, it will broaden out. And it will broaden out by an amount of about gamma. So that this transition won't be as sharp as I drew it, but will actually be spread out over a few gamma. And so when you look at the slope, the conductance will still be Q square over H. So that's the part. This will be spread out over gamma over H bar. And so when you look at the, uh, sorry, uh, gamma, gamma over, I mean, QV would be gamma, so gamma over Q. So it would be spread out over that range. And so when you take that and divide it by this, you'll get about Q square over H. So finally, the point is, even in this one level thing, although the thinking is now totally different, you still get that same, still get this upper limit on the conductance. But you really need wave mechanics to get this right, to get this broadening into the story. Now again, lots of times it doesn't matter because you have many levels which are very close together. If you spread them each all out, whether you spread them out or not doesn't really matter too much. So lots of times you don't worry about it. The semi-classical picture is fine. But it's the, only the quantum picture that will give you this broadening. Yeah, Now, one way to set the strength of S would be, again, sort of like what we did before. That here we said, well, I know when nu2 is zero, what n should be, etc. So what I could say is, I'll set the strength of S in the Schrodinger one by saying that after I integrate this over all energy, so supposing I find n by integrating over all energy, then what that will look like is so what i've done is this is psi so if i multiply by psi star that tells me the that's like the electron density but then i have to integrate over all energy because and when I integrate it over all energy, what I get, that should match whatever I got classically. That would be one way to set the strength of what this is. Now, in practice, the way you do it, of course, usually is you start with an infinite system and then you calculate and then you eliminate the outside and calculate what the strength is. That's how you get it in the regular NEGF method, how you, the way you would normally do it. What I'm trying to do is get you kind of bypass a lot of those details and roughly tell you how to see the answers. Because what I'm really trying to get across is the concepts behind it, not necessarily the details of the method itself. Okay. So this quantity then, <coughs> you could write as S1, S1 star over 2 pi. So what I did was I pulled out the S1, S1 star and divided by gamma over 2 pi and put a gamma over 2 pi there. Now why am I doing that? Well, because this is this Lorentzian function whose integral is 1. That's why I'm writing it that way. That's all. So. And then I can say, well, this should be equal to what I normally, what I expect it to be. And that's how I could kind of figure out what the strength of that source term should be to match. So, <clears throat> okay. 
But the important point that this method gets across is the idea that n or now if I want to calculate current, how would we do it? If you remember, we had these two ways of doing it. I could either do S1 minus nu 1 n or I could look at nu 2 n. And the easier one is of course that. So here also same thing. If I wanted current, I'd put a nu 2 here, which would be like gamma 2 over h bar. You could put that in. And then you'd have almost the same thing, but now with a gamma 2 over h bar here, that's all. So that's how you do the quantum treatment of this one level problem would proceed. Right? But the important thing is this just Schrodinger equation isn't enough you have to connect it to the contacts. And when you connect it to the contacts, it kind of automatically gives you this broadening that, <clears throat> that usually the Schrodinger equation we are used to, E psi equals H psi, that kind of gives you the resonant frequencies of an isolated system. So sort of like a guitar string, what are its resonant frequencies? But now what we are trying to do is excite this guitar string from el elsewhere. And the, what, the way you excite it, you don't have to match the resonant frequency exactly. It could be a little off and it would still vibrate. In fact, usually these things are so well damped that you could be well off and still be, it could still be vibrating actually. And so that's what we have kind of done, that we took this and added the damping terms to it. Now, the one other point that I want to make here, and that is the difference between this quantum treatment and the classical treatment. And that has to do with, you see, this was the simple classical treatment. And then for the quantum thing, what I did was I said, let's write it this way. We have a, this, uh, this was the basic Schrodinger equation, that's the damping term, the connection to the contacts, and this is the source. Here also we did exactly the same thing, okay. And in this discussion, we assume that electrons only come in from the left and not from the, we assume this is one, that's zero. Now what if we want to include the F1 and F2 into our discussion? So I've got some F1 here, some F2 here, and I, I say, we you know, we'd like to include all that. What I said was, well, assume one, one, the other is zero, and at the end of the day, you can always throw in the F1 minus F2. We kind of know what that part should be. But if you wanted to include it, here actually it's not very difficult, in the sense that all you'd have to do is, you'd have to, you know, I argued this one is actually the same as new one, but you could just add a new one F1 plus new two F2. So what I mean by that is, this is S1, and you could add a S2 like this. And if you went through the algebra, you'd get all the right answers with the F1 minus F2 in place. No problem at all. But the point I'm trying to drive home is you can't do the same thing with the quantum one. Because with the quantum one, we say, we, okay, now I've got two sources on two sides. So maybe I'll put a F1 here and a F2 there. Okay, and of course, we realize that uh, these are kind of like square roots of that one. So actually you'd probably have to put a square root of F1 and a square root of F2 if you had to, if you did that. Let's say you did that, but the point I'm trying to make is after that when you calculate psi and you calculate psi psi star, you get a bunch of unphysical terms. Why? Because you see, the psi then will look like S1 square root of F1 plus S2 square root of F2 divided by E minus epsilon plus I gamma over 2. Like we had before, we had only this one before, now we have two terms. Good, but then when I take psi psi star, I'm squaring this, and when I square this, I don't get two terms, I get four terms. I get a something that will look like S1, F1, something that will look like S2, F2, and those of course would be just like the classical thing. And then there would be stuff that are non-classical. There would be things like this. See? 
And those really should not be there. I mean, no experimental evidence for any, anything like this, right? With ordinary contacts, at least. With superconducting contacts, yes. I mean, in a way, Josephson effect is kind of like, between, like an interference between two contacts. But normal contacts, none of this. Why? And the argument is, well, you see, what happens is what comes in from contact one and what comes in from contact two are, have no phase correlation. So it's like, at this instant, uh, because these are complex numbers, but they have a random phase right, that changes with time. That's the way to think. So that this, a quantity like this has a phase that is randomly changing with time. And as long as you're looking at time average things, you never would see any of this. Whereas these are, of course, real numbers. So you can average for a very long time, you'd still see it. So that's the picture you have in mind. So that's why you need to drop all this. But this is the problem with trying to do quantum transport straight from Schrodinger equation. Problem meaning, if you have multiple sources, I cannot just put them in here and calculate. Because, you know, when we use Maxwell's equations, if you have multiple antennas, that's fine. They all go into the same Maxwell's equation, but then multiple antennas usually interfere because those are coherent sources that separate you. You know, two separate antennas would interfere, two lasers would interfere, and so on. But here it is like two incoherent things. They're not supposed to interfere. So you cannot just add them in. And so anybody who uses this, of course, the way they think about it is, they're supposed to do one source at a time. So you do this one, get your answers, weight it by F1. Take this one, weight it, do your calculation, weight it by F2, and so on, and then add it up. So as long as you keep that in your mind, you're fine. But you have to remember to do that properly, okay, in general. Now, what the NEGF method does is then, it says that, well, the fundamental thing then is that we can add up from many different things is not the psi itself, but the psi psi star. And so it works directly with the psi psi star and try to give you an equation for it. So it would be things like, Uh, so you would define psi psi star or psi psi dagger as this what I what we call the correlation function. So what that means is, of course, in this example, psi was just one number, and psi star again another number. So when you multiply, it's just one number. But more generally, what would have happened is the psi could be let's say two component. So it tells you the wave function at point one, wave function at point two, and Psi dagger then would also be two component. And when you multiply the two, you'll get a two by two matrix. And the diagonal elements, which is like, so let me actually write this. So let's say this is psi one, this is psi two. This is psi one star, this is psi two star. So when I multiply it out, you'll get things like this. Psi one, psi one star psi 2, psi 2 star, then psi 1, psi 2 star, and then psi 2, psi 1 star. So this is the basic quantity, this correlation function that you usually calculate in an NEGF formalism. And if you look at its diagonal elements, it is basically giving you the electron density. It is telling you how many electrons at point 1, how many electrons at point 2. But then it has some additional information, this part of it also in it. And many times you don't need it necessarily, and you could just look at the diagonal elements, it will give you the electron density. You see? And, <clears throat> and this is in general true, that in the quantum formalism, whatever you think semi-classically as, say, electron density. So if I had two points, I'd have to tell you the electron density here and the electron density here. So I'd have something like N1, N2. In the quantum way of thinking, what used to be two things kind of become four things. Because yeah, N1, N2, and then there's some more. That's usually what you deal with. And this is a quantity that if you find for one source, and then you find it for another source, you can just add them all up. I mean, they're all, you don't have to do it separately. They're all additive. So the way the quantum equations would look like, I think. Yeah. So let me just quickly give you an idea about the first equation on top and the third equation, the electron density equation, for example. 
right? So as I said, I'm not going to go through this very much. Just want to give you a flavor of where this came from. Because this is just the generalized matrix version of the simple thing I was doing. You see, that's it. And <clears throat> the way it works would be something like this, that basic Schrodinger equation looks like EI minus H times psi equals zero. That's the usual Schrodinger equation you'd see in textbooks. Then we say, well, now you have to connect it to the two contacts. One contact gives you a sigma one, another contact gives you a sigma two. So two contacts, and these are complex numbers in general, and the imaginary part of it is this gamma, the broadening. So usually you'd write gamma one is equal to I sigma one minus sigma one dagger. That's like taking the imaginary part. You do something like this. And the other thing is I now need a source term over here. So that would be S1. Good. Now from here I could write psi is equal to Green's function times S1, where this Green's function, by the way, nothing to do with conductance. I mean, yesterday I was using G for conductance continuously, and this G has nothing to do with that. Sir, if you use projection function, psi delta psi, then the of delta Yeah, then you just get one number, right? <laughs> yeah, so that would, that would basically just give you the sum of the two. But you really want this full information. If you, when you calculate Gn, so what I mean by that is, yeah, this is an important point. I wrote it this way, and this is a two by one. This is a two by one. So when I multiply the two things, I get a two by two. But if you multiply it other way, you'll get a one by one. You'll just get a number, which will actually be just your total number of electrons in the whole thing. That's all. And if that is all you want, that's what you'd calculate. But in the NEGF formalism, Usually what you are calculating is this full correlation matrix, right? So that equation up there, the GN equation, this second equation, that is really tells you this. This is what you are looking at, okay? And the way you get the GN then would be something like this, psi, psi dagger is equal to G, <coughs> S1, S1 dagger, G dagger. So psi is equal to G S1, and what is G? It's the inverse of that. That's the green function of the system. It's the inverse of this matrix. And that's the first equation up there, you see? G is equal to EI minus H minus sigma's inverse. That's it. So it tells you the response of the system. If I hit it with a source S, what wave function created inside. That's the response, right? That's the green function of the system. Yeah. I have a couple of First, uh, the way you calculate psi in the quantum picture, it's not a solution, it's a So, yeah, we are doing a one electron wave function. So, in a way, what I did is the special case of when H is just a one by one. You know, this can be a matrix of generally 10 by 10, 100 by 100, whatever it is. And what we just went through is the case when this was one by one. That's all. And, and it's a number, right? I, I don't mean it as an operator at all. I mean, if you, you could interpret it as a second quantized operator, et cetera, but that's kind of not necessary here, not beyond it. How did you write it? How did I write what? Um, The right hand picture. Right. How did you get the second? The equation? Oh, this one? Yeah. yeah. No, all I'm saying is we are motivated by the semi classical picture. Here I know exactly how, how to do it. And then I'm saying let's take the standard Schrodinger equation and modify it by adding a few terms so that it has the physics of the left one. Right? So the gamma one and the gamma two will give you the new one and the new two. And then you need a source term. And how do you find the strength of the source term? Well, the best way is to kind of again match the results you know in this context. 
If you did it from, uh, you know, more from first principles, then you would get it automatically. But here, if you're quickly trying to get the answer, go to the limits where you know the answers. And say that, well, the source has to be so much in order to give you sensible answers. Uh, yeah, the way I would say it, epsilon is the H, the gamma 1 is the sigma 1, gamma 2 is the sigma 2. Okay. And uh, when you add F1 and F2 top, won't that give you an extra quantity temporary? Yeah, the point I was trying to make is here you should not be adding F1 and F2 as it is because while on the left hand one you could easily add, you could put in the F1 and F2 here and the, it would all be done and you would get a current that it depends on F1 minus F2, you all done, no problem at all. Here, if you add a F1 and a F2, you don't get the right physics at all. So here you shouldn't be doing it. On the other hand, you can do it in NEGF. NEGF, and that is why I guess I'd say, you know, if you had uh, that why we need NEGF rather than do Schrodinger, is that in Schrodinger, you have to be very careful about these tricky points, that different sources are incoherent. Well, the NEGF kind of handles that nicely. That's what it is. I just need a few clarifications. So, I mean, diagrams are equation. You have to diagram there. What is gamma one and what is the sigma super plus? Ah, okay. So, these sigma one and sigma sigma one is really this thing, right? This is sigma two. That's this one. And when I write a plus, I mean dagger. That's conju conjugate transpose. So, for one, if this was a number, this would be like taking the negative imaginary part of sigma. So basically, if this was minus i gamma over 2, that would be gamma. Now, in the matrix sense, of course, what you're looking at is what you might call the anti-Hermitian component of sigma 1 in the matrix sense, right? So these are all matrix generalizations of this simple. Yeah, this, as I said, won't get clear in this time if you haven't seen it already. And as I said, in this room, I think there are some of you who have seen it already whom I can't add much to probably in this direction. And the others, I'm just trying to get across the philosophy, the conceptual picture behind it rather than the details of it. Okay. What's the significance for the off diagram? The G, after? Yeah, maybe uh, tomorrow when I talk about spin, that is one very good example where you can appreciate what those terms are about, right? So I'll bring that up tomorrow. Lot of times you are just looking at the electron density, in which case you just pick up the diagonal terms. In fact, if you don't have to calculate the off-diagonal terms, computationally often that's good because there's so much less that you have to store and all that, right? And it makes things much easier actually if you can just ignore the rest. But the equations themselves, of course, give you the whole thing, okay? Though the equations I had up there and what I, sorry, what I was trying to explain to you was, mm, that what I'm trying, what I got to you was that first equation, the green function, what that means. It's like EI minus H and then these sigmas, inverse. And why is that important? Well, because that times psi is equal to the source. And so psi is equal to inverse of this times the source. And the inverse of this is what you call the Green's function. That's it. That's the significance of that top one. And what I'm trying to get across now is the third one, that the GN equation, where that came from here. Yeah. So if you take this again. In this context, I would say the motivation is just the one level thing where if this was minus i gamma over, over 2, this would be gamma. You see what I mean? That if that gamma in the one level problem, the gamma represented the, oops. In this one level problem, the gamma represents the rate at which it leaks out. So if it leaks out at a certain rate, then the corresponding self energy has to be minus i times half of that. Self energy meaning what we put into here. And in general, if you want a leaking out described by some kind of a matrix, what should be here should obey that relation. So this is. So I'm saying it is, of course, hard to go from a one number to a matrix. It is from the matrix to one number is a unique process. 
from one number is hard to de deduce what the matrix version would look like. But this is just to motivate it, that's all. I'm not really deriving it here. Okay. Okay. But what I want to show you very quickly is how you got the third equation, right? And that is, as I said, psi equals g s. So when you take psi psi dagger, it's g s s dagger g dagger. And this thing is the strength of the source term. And here, in the one level case, sorry, in the one level case, what you get is the strength of the source term is proportional to gamma, which kind of makes sense that if you couple something strongly, if the contact is coupled strongly, the corresponding source from the source is also stronger. So gamma is the rate at which it goes in and out, and that's proportional to the source. And in general also this is true, that this is like proportional to gamma 1. And so the expression you get then is gn is equal to g gamma 1 g dagger. So just from here, if you accept that the strength of the source is gamma, you'll get that. And my point is that here, all the different sources like F1, F2, etc., they can be superposed. So what I mean is, I was trying to make the point that you cannot just take S1 multiplied by square root of F1, S2 multiplied by square root of F2. You couldn't do that. But here what you can do is, you can multiply this by F1 and then have a G gamma 2 G dagger, multiply that by F2, etc., and you're done. That's it. And that's like the third equation there actually, up there. Gn, if you look at it, oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, I guess I moved off, yeah. The third equation there for the electron density, Gn is G gamma 2 G dagger F2 plus G gamma 1 G dagger F1, okay? So the point I'm trying to make is, yeah, these are the general equations of NEGF. And if you're trying to seriously learn NEGF, I'd say there's two parts to it. One is understanding where these equations come from, and the second is how to use those equations. And those are almost disjoint. You can do that in any order, almost, right? <laughs> and because in terms of how to use it, it is almost like, well, once you know how to write the matrices, you can go ahead and use it. And I say, you know, that's the power and the danger of any GF, that you know, it's kind of scary how much you can calculate without understanding anything. <laughs> And, but the nice thing about it is that once you know how to implement it, if you do it right, you know, it doesn't take too much thing. You don't have to understand everything before you start, you know, looking at real calculations. As, and so you can actually use the calculations to improve your understanding of things. Well, you know, what would happen here? Well, let's try it out, kind of thing. You see, can you almost use it in that mode? Okay. So let me just spend the next few minutes showing you two examples, two examples or maybe one example depending on the thing, of things that would come out of this formalism. As I said, I didn't really derive it for those who haven't seen it before. I mean, there's no way we could do it, you know, in the, it could sink in in this time. It takes long, much longer than this to see all this properly. But what I try to motivate is exactly the question I always get from people is, well, if I want to do quantum transport, why can't I start with Schrodinger equation? Why do I need NEGF? And the point is just this. Yeah, you could start with Schrodinger equation in a way, but then you have to figure out how to put in the contacts. Because what you learn in all your quantum mechanics courses is a lot about the Hamiltonian, not much about the sigmas, about this contact part of it. And the simplest thing is the, con the real contacts, which as I said, usually in transport theory, in the past, nobody even worried about sigma 1 and sigma 2. Historically, when people were dealing with big conductors, the physics of resistance was all in the sigma s. And that's a whole lot harder to write down, actually. The sigma 1 and sigma 2, those are relatively simple things to put in. Okay. So as examples, one of the examples I often use is this one. That's called, the, I've shown here two problems that, that's done here. One is a wire so you have this channel and somewhere in here there is a big obstacle and that's that delta function in the middle you know which is a big potential thing that whenever electrons hit it they tend to get reflected you know so they don't quite transmit through it very well 
but they transmit somewhat. And so you calculate the conductance function the, or this transmission that we talked about, normalized conductance as a function of energy and what you get is that blue curve in there. That is, as you go higher in energy, you can get through the barrier a little better. So the transmission or the conductance improves, so that's that. But what is striking is, when you put in two scatterers there, so you got two of them. You see? And then you use this formalism, and of course this is based on Schrodinger equation, it has all the interference effects in it and so on. And so now you find that at certain energies, you, you actually get peaks, that's that red curve. You see, you're looking at the conductance. At certain energies, you have this very sharp peaks which almost show perfect conduction. You see, this is a wave property. This is something that would never come out of a standard of any particle picture. You know, a particle picture, I said, is like a highway. You know, you have a construction zone, there's a hard time people have getting through it. And you do not alleviate their traffic problem by con building another tra construction zone in front of it. But, but when it comes to waves, that's exactly almost what's happened. You have a barrier and you put another one, at the right energy, it actually helps you get through. Why? Because the reflection from the two interfere, and if the wavelength is right, it will cancel out. But in particle terms, there's no way an electron can get through two barriers better than it can get through one. Under certain conditions, they may be equal, but it couldn't be better than that. Okay? So that could recover. So if you are at an energy like C, you can see you have perfect transmission through the two barriers. And if you're at a place like D, then it is much less than what you expect, actually, you see? Yes, sir. So this is a wave property that would actually come out of this kind of calculation, and this wouldn't be coming out of this, uh, the discussion we had yesterday, the semi-classical transport, <clears throat> where I said, well, if you had two barrier, where we had a distributed thing, so, it, Anytime there is, when you had a distributed scattering process, what happened was the occupation of the positive going things went down gradually. And as we said, the transmission goes as lambda over L plus lambda. Now that is all semi-classical result, of course. That is when you neglect interference. But once, once you include interference, that's not what will happen. If you have these two barriers, it is not like they would necessarily behave in that semi-classical way, okay. So this is one thing a quantum formalism gets you. Now what if you include, say, many scatterers? So again, when you have many scatterers, of course, the semi-classical picture would give you this. This is what we know with many scatterers. There would be places where it would suddenly go down a little bit. You know, this is localized scatterers. Here we had distributed, yesterday we had distributed scatterers, but with localized scatterers, it would go down in steps, etc. And at the end of it, if you use that classical thinking, you get that red curve. And again, a smooth curve, no sharp functions. If you, if you know what it is for one scatterer, you can figure, figure out what it should be for six scatterers. But quantum mechanically, of course, the answers depend on how those six scatterers happen to be placed. Now, question is, in the real world, would you see this? And the answer is, most of the time, at least at room temperature, what you'd really see is the classical one. You wouldn't see the quantum. I mean, and it's not because I think, uh, there's anything wrong with the wave picture. It is just that usually there's a lot of incoherent processes, a lot of dephasing going on. What it means is that sh sure you have one scatterer here and another one here. And we are saying they will interfere, but the thing is you have at room temperature, all these atoms are jiggling around. So when an electron goes through this, it does not see a fixed potential. It sort of sees a jiggling thing. And so its phase is continue. What it sees at this instant is different from what it sees a picosecond later or a, another picosecond later. And anything we are measuring, of course, is averaged over nanoseconds at least, probably micro or milliseconds. Right? And so at the end of the day, you do not see much. So are you saying that you're missing 
So in any GF, you could put in a sigma s, the scattering term in the right way, and it would actually get you the classical curve. So this is one thing I'd say is a good, again, a good homework problem to go through actually, that the quantum one, the one I wrote there, that one only has a sigma one and a sigma two, but no scattering sigma. But by putting in enough of a scattering sigma, you could turn the quantum curve into a classical curve, and that way NEGF allows you to bridge that entire regime from the pure quantum calculation to what you'd expect out of Boltzmann. The classical curve is essentially what you'd get out of Boltzmann, you see? So th this is a good example, and, th and those quantum effects though at low temperatures are sometimes C, because people, uh, you know, I said that it always averages out over time. Now that's kind of true, but in big conductors, there is also what people call ensemble averaging, which means they say that, well, it's a, uh, if you have a big conductor like this, it's kind of like as if you got lots of little conductors. And if this one has one kind of interference, that one has a different one, that one has a different one, and what you're measuring is an average. So 30 years ago, of course, everybody assumed that anything you measure is some kind of an ensemble average. And it's no point calculating sample specific things. But what was found is that when you started looking at small conductors, you could often see sample specific things. So for example, with uh, certain small conductors, people would measure a conductance versus gate voltage. So let's say with a gate voltage, I change the carrier density. And what is supposed to happen is it's supposed to go up because carrier density is going up. But with small conductors at low temperatures, they would see something like this. I mean, average would go up, but there will be a lot of these conductance fluctuations. See? And the interesting thing was you think, well, that's just noise. But the thing is, it's not noise in the sense it's reproducible. You go back the next day, it's still exactly the same pattern. Okay? So it's not noise in that sense. You see? And the other interesting thing they found was, in those days, I remember, they would take this conductor, bring it up to room temperature. You see the measurement is being done at 4 Kelvin or lower. But then they bring it up to room temperature and then they cool it down again, measure it again. And now they see a different pattern. Something else. And the understanding is that what happened in the process of bringing it to room temperature and taking it back is that the impurities moved around. Because this pattern, of course, depends on exactly how these scatterers are arranged. You see, if they, uh, if this one is not here but another, but say moves away by a fifth of a wavelength, then of course you'll have a different pattern altogether because it depends on this interference between them. But as long as you keep it at 4 Kelvin, you could measure day after day and still be seeing the same thing. So these were experiments like in the early 90s, which actually, you know, established this reality of this quantum interference in the sense it is measurable. On the other hand, it's true that at room temperature, much of this doesn't play any real role. Okay? And there's this entire field, of course, of localization, which is related to that, yeah. So you told that you didn't take scattering? In that quantum one, there's no scattering. How the information on the uh, scattering center? Oh, no, no, I, let, uh, let me make that, uh, let me qualify that. When I say scattering, what I mean is, like, you know, when we model this, there's a H and then there's a sigma. Now, these scatterers I'm putting into the H. So in the Hamiltonian itself, you have certain potentials. Okay. Now, to destroy that interference, what you have to do is connect this to a sigma S in the sense that th those would be like incoherent processes that actually dis actually change the phase relationships and all that. So there is a big difference between putting something in a sigma and putting something in a h. Okay. So when I say there is no scattering in the quantum calculation, what I mean is there is no sigma s. The sigma s that kind of serves to deface things and destroy phase information and all that. But as long as you put in a specific potential in h, there's no dephasing. It's a coherent thing. It will give you interferences, everything. And that's what that quantum calculation is about. 
So this is a good example to go through if you're trying to learn NEGF, because basically you'd have to, it's a one dimensional problem. So you, and then what you have to learn is how to write the H, how to write the sigmas, et cetera. Right? This is a good one dimensional problem. And if you come to this, then I'd say the next step usually is, I recommend is trying the Hall effect. That's a two nice two dimensional problem to do. But it's harder because, you know, in two dimensions, then you have to learn how to write the H, how to write the sigmas, et cetera. But what you, uh, you can use NEGF to actually calculate the Hall, Hall voltage as a function of the magnetic field, and it will, you know, show you this classic results that, you know, as you know, one of the striking results that has been observed in two-dimensional conductors is that this Hall resistance, which starts out linearly with magnetic field, but at high magnetic fields shows these very exact quantizations and so on. Okay, that's the one. Since it's almost 10 o'clock, yeah, let me stop here and we'll continue in the next lecture. Okay, go ahead. What is the typical values of uh, gamma 1 and gamma 2? For the contacts in a... Yeah, this, I guess I'd usually say that the rate at which electron escapes, let's say it's 10 to the 12th per picos, 10 to the 12th per second, the corresponding gamma would be a millivolt or so. Much less than room KT. KT is 25 millivolt at room temperature. But when you're actually doing these one dimensional wires, what you want to have is perfect uh, coupling to the contacts. And I think those gammas are, <coughs> bigger than the one millivolt, I think, is not a perfect coupling to the contact. So there, I think, what needs to happen is it kind of matches the tight binding hopping parameter. So what I mean is, usually in a tight binding model, there is this T0 which couples different levels, and I think the gamma is of the same order as that. <coughs> anyway. So, so we'll continue at 10.30.